Hello, my name is Jamie Bernstein and I'm the Executive Director of the Children's Commission. Welcome to today's webcast entitled Child Welfare Case Primer, Statutory Hearings and Current Issues. This hour and 15 minute webcast is designed to provide a high level overview of statutory hearings and current issues in child welfare cases in Texas. For those of you who are new to this area of law, this material can serve as an orientation. For those of you who have had several years on the bench or practice in the courtroom, this webcast can serve as a refresher course. Information about how to obtain MCLE will be shared at the end of the webcast. Now it is my honor to introduce our speaker, Judge Rob Hoffman. Judge Hoffman presides over the 452nd Judicial District Court and serves as the Children's Commission Senior Jurist in Residence. As a former attorney in child welfare cases, former child protection court judge, former foster parent, and current district court judge, Judge Hoffman brings his wisdom and experience to bear on this topic. The Children's Commission is grateful for Judge Hoffman's dedication to providing educational opportunities for judges and attorneys in child welfare law and for being a frequent speaker on our behalf. I'll now turn over our webcast to Judge Hoffman. Thanks, Jamie, and howdy, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. We're going to have about an hour and 15 minutes worth of information, a lot to digest, and we're going to jump right into it. So let's say you're a judge and you've just gotten your first CPS case placed on your docket. What do you do now? Uh, we're going to start with a general overview, but mainly what we're going to be talking about today are some best practices for judges and also attorneys. We're going to be talking about the statutory overview of all of the hearings that are required. Uh, we're going to be talking about some recent legislation that's been pretty impactful for us, and also some other important individual populations and issues as we move forward. So with regards to our presentation overview, overview we're, we're going to be basically talking about the fundamental best practices for judges and attorneys in child welfare cases. These are some main topics that we wanna think about as we go through every slide and every topic that we talk about today. First of all, how we engage families and also youth voice. It's very important for us to get those parents involved and also listen to the children who are involved in our cases. We're gonna be talking about positive permanency and what that means and how to get there. We'll go in depth into that as we move forward. We want to always talk about using a trauma-informed approach to all the work that we do, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about exactly what that means. We'll talk about the nuts and bolts of a CPS case, and then things to remember about issues such as dual status youth and what that means, educational issues, community-based care, it's coming to a neighborhood near you, and also residential treatment centers, which we call RTCs. And all throughout the presentation, we'll have some helpful resources. So let's start then talking about some common terms and acronyms. There are a bunch that we'll talk about throughout the show. I hope that I'll be able to remind you what they are, but here's some just general as we get started. First of all, most everyone knows that CPS means Child Protective Services. COS, means court ordered services. And those services have gotten a lot of attention recently from our legislature, we'll focus on them. DFPS is the Department of Family and Protective Services. It's kind of interchangeable with CPS, but it is a, a larger parent organization uh, over CPS. TFC, of course, as everyone knows, is the Texas Family Code. And TMC and PMC are language unique to the state of Texas, but of course that means temporary or permanent managing conservatorship. And of course, that's very important for us to uh, know and talk about as we move forward. So we're gonna begin here with the fundamentals. Um, it's important for us to always to remember to start with the child welfare case with the end in mind. Even at the very beginning from our first contact with the family, we need to be thinking about the end of the case and, and a good resolution. Always remember, your role as a judge or as an attorney if you're watching, and as a judge especially, you're setting the tone for the entire case in your courtroom, in your interaction with the agency, and in your interaction with costs and families as well. As I've already said, it is critically important for us to engage family, and that includes, of course, birth mom, 
uh, but dads as well, step parents, and extended family, even if it's fictive kin, it is extremely critical to get that family of origin involved right off the bat so we can make some good progress. We want to also remember that positive permanency for our kids is urgent and maintain that urgency throughout the entire case, even after we have a final order and as our children get close to aging out of care. And as I've already said, we want to layer everything with a trauma-informed approach, which we'll talk about more in a bit. So judicial leadership is the first thing that we need to talk about because it is extremely important that you set the tone in your courtroom and in your interaction with all of the agencies and folks that you deal with. And we know our attorney's powers and duties are set out in the Texas Family Code there in chapter 107. But when the judge sets the tone for the courtroom, attorneys respond to that, caseworkers, CASAs, parents, and even kids res respond to the tone that the judge sets in the courtroom. We know that when judges are really engaged and set high expectations, parents, attorneys prepare their clients better for court and get them ready to answer questions, but also to express their needs and concerns. We have attorney ad litems ready to speak on behalf of their child clients and also have their kids prepared to present in court and meet with the judge, maybe in chambers or maybe on Zoom in a breakout room. And then we have our attorneys and parties and CASAs working together to think about creative placement options that could lead to positive permanency. Because usually uh, it's a, a result of working together that we have good outcomes if we can't have reunification. And we also need to remember that the judges as well as the attorneys should always address whether reasonable efforts are being made. And we'll talk a little bit more about reasonable efforts here in a bit. So why do we engage families in youth? Well, it seems obvious, but I wanna drill down a little bit and, and talk about it. We know that families and even our kids that are in court are the experts on their lives. And they're the person and the folks that we can talk to you about exactly what's going on in the home, what is needed to stabilize the home, to make it safe, and also to talk about different placements if the home reunification is not a possibility. So if you ask a child, what is the best thing we can do to solve the problem in your home? They're probably going to have an answer that they wanna to talk to you about. Also, it is critically important to engage parents right from the get-go to explain to them the severity of what's at stake in a termination proceeding. At every single hearing that I have in a child welfare case, I tell my parents, you understand that if we don't get these issues resolved, your parental rights are subject to being terminated. And also, if you engage parents, you have their buy-in, and that is critical for positive permanency. Certainly if it's reunification, but also for positive permanency, perhaps with a relative or a fictive kin. It's really critical to have that buy-in from those parents, even if they're not successfully working their service plans. So what is positive permanency? Well, DFPS tells us in their guide that positive permanency means that the child exits DFPS care into a permanent setting that includes a legal relationship to a family. So of course, number one, that would be reunification. And that's the goal that ultimately we're seeking um, always in a case. If that's not a possibility, adoption by a relative or a fictive kin or a non-fictive uh, person. And also we have the choice of PMC or permanent managing conservatorship to a relative for another individual. Those are positive permanency outcomes. And as we've said, keeping those things in the back of your mind every time you need a child, every time you have a hearing is critical to start with the end in mind. So why is it important for us to have positive permanency? Some of these things kind of speak for themselves as well, but I wanna go through them because I think it's important for us to remember and keep them in the back of our mind. Obviously, every child deserves a, fam a family. They're going to be more successful uh, in that situation. Every child will benefit from positive and healthy and stable relationships. And that's really what we're looking for as we exit a stable relationship for our kids as we uh, send them off into the world. Again, we've talked about urgency and how important it is to be focusing on 
that positive permanency as we move forward because we don't have a lot of time to get this issue resolved. So uh, the Children's Bureau quote is there telling us what they think positive permanency is. I'm not gonna read it to you, uh, but it's really important that we focus on that. My notes remind me that um, if kids age out of care, that one out of every four of them is going to be homeless within four years of leaving care. So it's very important if we think about that, if we let our kids turn 18 in foster care, one in four of them is going to perhaps be homeless. And of course, we know what happens to those kids. They may be addicted to drugs. They may be trafficked in the sex industry uh, or other terrible outcomes. Also, we know that statistics from the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition tell us that nearly 70% of young males involved in the foster care system are arrested after leaving foster care. And that's like a 23% higher uh, number than the general population. So it is critically important for us not to just remove kids if their health and safety is at risk, but to put them back into a po positive permanent place uh, when we send them on their way. So we talked a little bit about trauma-informed care, and we're gonna spend a few minutes here talking about what a trauma-informed approach is. In a trauma-informed system, and we hope our court system and our child welfare system and our juvenile justice system and really all of our systems across the state are trauma-informed and we're moving in that direction. In a trauma-informed system, there's a focus on treating and healing the experiences of not only the child, but of the parents as well. And that's a new concept that you might wanna think about for a second. But part of restoring and reunifying and finding permanence for kids is healing the trauma of not only the kids, but the parents as well. So this trauma-informed system is research-based and it requires the participation of everyone involved, every single person that a family has contact with in the system. That includes the bailiff standing at the back of the courtroom, uh, your court coordinator or your secretary when they answer the phone. So the goal of this approach is to produce better outcomes for children and their families, and that will help reduce recidivism, which is a, an issue that we deal with uh, quite frequently. This approach reduces recidivism and it reduces the number of families who enter the system as well. That's important. So throughout the life of a case, courts and judges and attorneys can seek to identify trauma suffered by the children and their parents and address that as we move forward. And trauma may, may be uh, occurring even after the case begins. So we can do our best. And here's some examples that I have in my notes about how to have a trauma-informed approach. So first of all, simply creating a physical courtroom environment that is child-friendly. You know, some folks and some courts have beautiful murals, they have toys or books or posters, comfortable chairs, snacks, things like that in their courtroom, just to make the courtroom more inviting for kids and families. Something that I think is, that is really important that maybe we often overlook is addressing people by their names. It's easy when you have a lot of cases on your docket to say mom, dad, attorney, but it is really critical to have a connection with our parents to have them engage. So call them by their name, Mrs. Williams, Mr. Smith, or sometimes even if I know these folks personally, I will call them by their first name if it's appropriate. Also, when we're talking about creating our service plans, it's a critical not just to rubber stamp that service plan at the status hearing, but to be specific and have services that are chosen for the individualized needs of parents and their children as well, and not just use bullet points. Now, as you can imagine, there are a lot of materials that the Children's Commission has available with regards to judicial trauma uh, res resolutions. And on the Children's Commission webpage, if you get in there, you can find tons of information. So we'll have a link to that later on. So now we're gonna kind of switch gears for a second and talk about the overview of a child welfare case from beginning to end and what it typically could look like. So here are the legal stages of a child welfare case. And this is going from the very beginning all the way to potentially the very end. We have an investigation stage, and that's when a referral is made to DFPS. Someone calls in an 
allegation of abuse or neglect to the hotline or a teacher or law enforcement officer makes that referral over the computer. Then potentially there is the filing of a petition and that's by the agency filing a legal petition requesting that the court approve the removal of the child from their home to protect the child. The next step would be an emergency removal hearing. We call that our ex parte hearing. And that does not have to be done in the courtroom. It is ex parte. Lots of times it's me sitting in my office reading something that was just emailed to me. That's the ex parte hearing. And then the judge approves the removal or denies the removal. If the removal is approved, then you would have the adversary hearing. And that's to determine whether the department will continue as the temporary managing conservator of the child or children. After that, we have a status hearing. At that hearing, that's when you talk about the service plan for the parents, but also the service plan for the children as well. And that's when we really need to focus, especially on that trauma-informed care that we were talking about. After that, we have permanency hearings. They're called permanency hearings before final order. And that's when we review the parents' progress on their service plans and also the children's needs and how they're doing in care. We'll talk a little bit more about what those permanency hearings are about. Now there are deadlines, of course, if there is no agreement for a final order, then there must be a trial. And that would then, of course, determine the placement of the children moving forward. And then here's some permanency outcomes. This is the last bullet here in the, in the slide. Uh, we've already talked about reunification, adoption, perhaps relative custody or adoption, or maybe even permanent custody to DFPS, which isn't a great outcome, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So here are the legal options at the end of an investigation. So we're starting back now again at the very beginning with investigations. As you can see on the left at the low end of the stairs there, allegations can be ruled out or the concerns are addressed or you could find that no services are necessary. And actually most of the calls that come in to statewide intake alleging abuse or neglect are actually ruled out. I think more than 50% of those. The next step is the option to have what we call family-based safety services. Here's another acronym, FBSS. And family-based safety services mean that the agency is working with the family, that there are safety is issues present, that the parents are voluntarily complying and the agency can work with them without the necessity of court intervention. The next step up is what we call court-ordered services. We already talked about that acronym, but that would be where there are safety issues present and the court is required to enter orders with regards to the interaction between the family and the agency. So the court would order parents to participate in services, order the agency to provide those services, and then the court would review the compliance uh, from both parties uh, moving forward. And then of course, ultimately, the most severe remedy at the end of an investigation would be temporary managing conservatorship to DFPS. And that would be where safety issues are present and it would require the child to be removed from the family. Okay, so a little bit more about court ordered services. We had some really great legislation this session. I think the best thing the legislature did and has done in, in a long time is give us a little bit more power, a little more tools to work with to deal with court-ordered services. So when the agency files a request for court-ordered services, not removing the child into care, but working with the family, with the children at home, we now have the ability to appoint attorneys for the parents, attorney ad litems for the parents, and also for the children. That is going to be a great tool for everyone to use. Now, there's a standard for these court-ordered services hearings, and this is what it is. The court must deny the petition to order the court-ordered services unless the court makes a finding under the ordinary prudence and caution standard that abuse and neglect has occurred or that there's a substantial risk of abuse or neglect or continuing danger and that services are necessary to ensure the physical health or safety of the child. That's the new standard. And of course, you can review it. It's there in the family. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the adversary hearing, assuming that the department is asking that the children be removed and placed into the temporary custody of the department. 
There are two types of adversary hearings. They're very similar, and you can go back and review this later. But one would be uh, when the, the child was removed prior to a petition being filed, and the other would be when the child was removed upon the order after the filing of the petition. And so we have our standard here, and this is what your standard is for the adversary. Unless the child has already been returned, and sometimes that happens, the full adversary hearing must be held not later than the 14th day after the child was taken into possession by the governmental entity. So if the child was taken into possession without a court order and the judge doesn't sign the order till a couple of days later, it doesn't matter. The day that you start counting is the day the child comes in to custody of the department. And there's several things that you need to make sure are happening in your court as the judge. But most of these things the department is working on that you need to ensure that they are doing what they're supposed to. First of all, you have to talk about the court of continuing jurisdiction issues. Make sure that all parties have been served. Lots of times we get moms served that have struggles getting dad or the multiple dads served. So that is something that's important for us to talk about right off the bat when we get to court. And also, obviously, make sure that that child has an attorney and guardian ad litem appointed as required by law. Now, another good thing that's happened over the last several years is that parents also have the right to have appointed counsel if they are indigent and if they appear in opposition to this suit. So parents have the right immediately to file an application for a court appointed attorney. If they're indigent, appoint that attorney immediately. And if they show up without an attorney at the adversary hearing and they're requesting one, uh, you really need to reset that hearing, give them time to have their attorney appointed if they qualify and to have a meaningful interaction with that attorney prior to the hearing. So at that adversary hearing, uh, we're going to do makes findings and orders. And here's a list of some things that you need to think about. Make sure certainly that there's evidence and sufficient evidence to grant continuing temporary managing and servicership to the department. We need to make sure that the department has made reasonable efforts to prevent the removal of the child. And we'll talk a little bit more about reasonable, reasonable efforts moving forward, but it is a requirement and a standard that is required that the department has made reasonable efforts. So that is also a finding that you have to make. The court also needs to make sure that the parents understand that their rights can be restricted or even terminated. This is uh, an important juncture in a case when you have those parents before you and you can look them in the eye and say, look, if we don't get this problem resolved, your rights can be restricted or even terminated. And at the conclusion of the adversary hearing, if I keep kids in care, I tell those parents, look, your odds are about 50-50 that you're going to have a reunification in this case. Uh, you really need to make it clear to them and explain to them the severity and also the urgency of moving forward. Courts can determine if aggravated circumstances exist. And we'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward. But if, if there are aggravated circumstances as to a parent, the court is not, the, the department is not required to uh, present a service plan for those parents. That doesn't happen a whole lot and there's a lot of technicalities surrounding that. So we'll delve into that more a little bit as we move forward. Also, the court can issue protective orders if necessary. Now this doesn't happen very often because the court's general order is going to cover most everything you need to, but the court does have the authority to issue additional protective orders if necessary. The court can place a child with the non-custodial parent. And a lot of times in the past, this didn't happen, but now we have new legislation and standards with regards to that. So the child must be placed with that non-custodial parent or another relative even, unless it's not in the child's best interest. So that is something you may really need to think about at that hearing not just uh, default into keeping the child into foster care, but really think about relative and non-custodial parent placement. Okay, finally, the court issues its orders and schedules the status hearing. So we're gonna switch gears for a second and talk about what are reasonable efforts. So as I said earlier, it is statutorily mandated in Texas that DFPS must make reasonable efforts to preserve and reunify families and to achieve permanency for children. 
We have the family code section here, and it explains uh, talking about exactly what reasonable efforts are. There's not a good definition. There's not a federal or state definition, but that section gives us a little bit more direction. The bottom line here, literally the bottom line on our, on our slide here is that a finding of no reasonable efforts results in the loss of federal funding to the state agency. Now there's nuances to that as well, but generally remember that you have a big tool here as a judge and a big tool to argue as an attorney that the department didn't make reasonable efforts. And if that finding is made, it cuts off federal funding, sometimes permanently, for the state agency. And you probably all know that the vast majority of our funds for federal, for foster care in Texas comes from the federal government. So reasonable efforts, a big issue to think about all throughout the case. So how can judges and even attorneys engage families and youth? Okay, so we wanna have parental buy-in. We've talked about that already a little bit and I'll reiterate here, judges, you on the bench, and certainly attorneys, when you're speaking with your clients, address those folks by their names. Now you can be formal, or you can even call them by their first name if you think that's appropriate. Also attorneys, of course, but judges as well, ask questions to kids, to children, to youth, ask them what they want, ask them what they need. Sometimes they're gonna tell you they want something that is absolutely not best for them, but it's still important to listen to their answers and respond and let them know that you are listening. So here's a little bit of silver lining from the COVID era that we live in. Something interesting happened when we started having all of our hearings on Zoom. All of a sudden, all these parents started showing up and communicating. You know, I, I usually say it's interesting to see folks in their natural habitat. Sometimes we have parents um, from their job. I've had guys have to step outside with their hard hat on, uh, talk to me on their mobile phone. Uh, from their work. Sometimes we have families at home, even sitting on their bed. I think there's, you know, stories about folks having to go out in the pasture out in West Texas so they can have connection. It's interesting to see those folks in the natural habitat, but the good thing is parents are more comfortable and um, easier to interact with, and also our kids are way more comfortable when they're maybe in their safe space, in their bedroom, on their bed with their stuffed animal. So it's a lot easier to engage kids in those hearings. And also just remember, it's very important as an attorney to build trust and communication with your client. And in doing so, like the slide says, you're facilitating what services they may need, planning those services, staggering them. And you're also building your legal case and also always thinking about possible placements. So, we want to think a little bit about kids, and we call this slide the whirlwind of out-of-home care. This is nothing new. Everybody knows everything on this slide, but sometimes it's good just to kind of think about uh, what happens to kids when they're removed from care. They probably didn't have a chance to say goodbye to their parents. They may not be placed with their siblings, and of course, they're wondering where everyone is and how they're doing. They may have a new placement in a new strange home a new bed, certainly things are going to be different. Customs and routine are generally going to be different. There may be other kids in the home that are other foster kids or even biological kids of the foster parents. Probably they didn't get a chance to take many of their possessions with them. Uh, they didn't even have a chance to gather things. Uh, you know, we've all seen the pictures of the trash bag suitcase that our foster kids have. And of course, moving forward, this is very traumatic and they're very uncertain. They're thinking about where am I gonna live? Am I gonna to get to go home? And also something that's really important, where will I go to school? And we'll talk a lot about education moving forward, uh, but just remember that amid all of this chaos, if we can keep our kids in their school of origin, that's great, uh, but there's a big challenge to getting that done as well. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So the next hearing that we're gonna talk about is our status hearing. After the ex parte and adversary hearing, generally we have a status hearing next. So here are the 
laws with regards to the status hearing and some bullets here to talk about what we need to focus on at that hearing. It has to be done within 60 days after the adversary hearing. And as I said earlier, the focus is to talk about the child's status, their placement, the services for the child, and also finalizing the parent's service plans. Now you need to do all the things you did at the adversary hearing. Uh, wrap up things with the extended jurisdiction, talk about service, talk about Indian child welfare issues. Keep asking all those questions, but now's the time that we're going to hammer out and finalize, and you're gonna approve and order that parent's first service plan if you're a judge. Remember to give those parents the warning that if they're not in compliance, at every hearing, tell them that they face modification or even termination of the parental rights if they can't get the issues resolved. If they don't have an attorney, maybe this is the first time a dad has shown up for court, make sure that you tell them at every hearing that they have the right to have an attorney. Now, it's really important. I can't stress this enough. At every hearing that you have any parent show up, if they've been served, if they haven't been served, if they've been established as a parent, if they're still just a presumed father, if they show up without an attorney at every hearing, tell them that they have the right to have an attorney if they're indigent. Even if that's the 25th hearing that you've had and that mom is there, tell her every time she has the right to have an appointed attorney. So the department also at the status hearing tells us information about the child's health because they're gonna have, have had some health reviews so they'll be talking about mental health, physical health, educational issues, placement, all those things uh, that we need to know about our kids. And also we'll talk about the visitation plan. It's really important. Uh, we need to try our best to maximize visitation between parents and family members and kids. And at the status hearing, you kind of set the goal for what that needs to look like and we'll carry on further in the case. So that's really something important to address at those hearings. Okay, so what happens next? Then we have permanency hearings and officially now they're called permanency hearings before final order. That's a long name for a hearing. Here's the code section where you can find them in the Texas Family Code. But here's a few bullets to remember at permanency hearings before final hearing. First of all, uh, they occur about every three months after that status hearing. The law is specific as to whether they are required to be within 120 days or 180 days. Now you need to review that. The service plans can be reviewed and modified at permanency hearings. And that's really what we're talking about is the department making reasonable efforts to reunify and is everyone participating in the plan, working their services. And very often those plans need to be modified and changed as we move forward. The children, the subject of the suit are required by law to attend every permanency hearing. You don't always see kids in court. Some courts, you never see kids in court, but the law requires that they be present for those hearings unless they're specifically excused. And of course, they can appear by phone or virtually now, uh, even if you're having a hearing in person, you can still have those kids appearing virtually so they don't have to miss much school. So the court looks at the status of the children and whether the parents are engaging in their services. We already talked about that. And we're also going to be talking about the permanency goals for each child in addition to reviewing their placement. So each child is going to have a permanency goal and hopefully that's reunification. Sometimes it's relative adoption. There are lots of different permanency goals and we'll talk about that in a bit. Also remember that for permanency hearings, you can have two permanency goals. And really that happens a lot. It's kind of a plan A, plan B. Generally, always family reunification is plan A. But at the same time, the department may be concurrently planning, and that may be for a relative adoption. So if a child is placed with grandma, we're still working to reunify, that it may be that the department is also working for grandma to be able to adopt that child. And there's a lot of things that have to be done for a relative adoption so that those relatives can receive some federal and state benefits but I'm getting ahead of myself. So at the permanency hearing, uh, certainly you're gonna talk about when the next permanency hearing is and when the trial is as well. Okay, so here we're gonna talk about the permanency goals for children in use. We've got two columns here. First of all, our positive permanency goals and then other 
permanency goals. Jamie didn't call them negative permanency goals. She just called them other. But we're going to talk about positive first. Certainly, we've hammered on it a lot already today. Family reunification is a positive permanency goal that we're all shooting for. And then we also have alternate families. So it could be a, a relative adoption, a kinship adoption. So an aunt or someone else that's a blood relative could have an adoption. You could also have conservatorship to that relative without adoption. So just a PMC to an aunt or uncle, something like that. Unrelated adoption, of course, happens a lot. We have foster parents that adopt kids all the time. And that is a positive permanency goal for our kids. Also, you could have unrelated conservatorship. It doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes we have teachers, perhaps, or another fictive kin that takes managing conservatorship of our kids. And that happens a lot for our older kids. That is a positive permanency outcome. Okay, on the other side of the slide here, our other permanency goals. APLA. If you hear APLA in court, it's generally not a good thing. What that means is another planned permanent living arrangement, not necessarily a good outcome. So that could be something like CPS having permanent conservatorship of a child. Or you could have joint conservatorship with a foster family in the department or another relative in the department. And then finally, we have independent living, which would mean perhaps that a child is about to turn 18 without a positive outcome, and we have to be preparing them for independent living. Remember, we can always have uh, two goals. Okay, so we're gonna talk about statutory deadlines now. So we know that in the family code that the initial deadline for any case where the department is named as terminate, per, temporary managing conservative of the child is 12 months, okay? So that's 12 months from the day that the, that the court orders temporary managing conservatorship. If the trial does not commence on that day, and that means if you're in a jury, the jury being seated and evidence beginning, if that trial does not commence, the case is automatically dismissed. No one has to file a motion. You just automatically lose jurisdiction. Of course, that is something that we don't want to have happen. Now, also, most of you know that upon a finding of extraordinary circumstances, the deadline can be extended only once and only up to six months. Now, it happens in more than 50% of our cases, so I'm not sure actually how extraordinary those circumstances are. But Texas has kind of a truncated time frame, a little bit tighter than federal law requires, which is a good thing, because the purpose of this is to make sure we achieve permanency for our kids in a timely manner and just uh, prevent kids from languishing in foster care. When I began as an attorney, as Jamie said, back when I was representing the department for a few years, there wasn't this requirement. And we had kids who were in the temporary custody of the department for years and years and years. So it's a good thing. And we're getting back on track after COVID to make sure that we get back into that truncated 12-month day. Okay, one option that we have also is a monitored return of the child to the parent under the family code. So we're going to talk about a monitored return. This is something we haven't mentioned so far. So sometimes things are going great and it's time to think about reunification of the child with the family, but the department or the court still wants to have a little bit of control and monitoring over the circumstances. So this code gives us the option for the court to retain jurisdiction for up to six additional months, not dismiss the case and not render a final order, but have a six month monitored return. Here are the findings. You have to find that retaining the jurisdiction is in the best interest of the child. You order the department to return the child to their parent, and then continue that service plan for the child services, for the parent services, and have an order. It is a temporary order. What is necessary to get done, that service plan remains in place. The department remains as temporary managing the servitor of the child or the children. And really the obligation of the department remains the same. They're still the temporary managing the servitor and they have the uh, requirement to monitor the placement of the child and also monitor the progress of the parents. That's a six month monitored return. 
So we talked about that deadline in 12 months, sometimes up to six months after that under our COVID orders a little bit longer. Here are the outcomes that can be reached at the end of that time frame. First of all, family reunification, which we're always looking for. The child is returned to one or both of their parents and CPS is completely dismissed and the case is closed. That's a great outcome. Sometimes both parents for children relinquish their parental rights and the child is placed with a relative or adopted out by a relative or CPS receives permanent conservatorship in anticipation of that adoption. There could be conservatorship, a conservatorship agreement with a non-parent and CPS is dismissed. So this is like I said earlier, a relative, maybe a teacher, somebody gets PMC, permanent conservatorship of the child and the case is dismissed. We just talked about the return and monitor and send that child home for six months to make sure that reunification is going to work. Sometimes CPS or DFPS receives permanent conservatorship of the children and the rights are not terminated. This is not necessarily a good outcome. It happens sometimes. It happens a lot less now than it used to, but sometimes that is the outcome. Or if there's not a resolution, the case goes to trial. You can see the judge's hammer there at the end of the slide. So we're going to talk about that final hearing. Let's move forward and see what that looks like. So here's the statute with regards to the termination trial. Now remember, the trial has to commence before that dismissal date, or that case is dismissed by operation of law. And that doesn't mean that, judge, you just call the case, everyone makes an announcement, and you recess. Uh, that is not commencement of trial under our law. So uh, you have to make sure you understand what officially is commencement of trial but then it can be recessed. Uh, the second red bullet there says that the final hearing can be before a jury or a judge, but we all know there is a constitutional right in the state of Texas to have this trial before a jury. Not many states have that right anymore, but Texas is certainly one of them. At trial to seek termination, CPS must prove two things as to every single child and every single parent. So if you think about a case where you have one mom and two or three dads, sometimes there's cases with two moms and three or four dads, each child as to each parent has to have two grounds, two things met. First of all, there must be a legal ground from the family code met by clear and convincing evidence. And also that termination of the parental right between that child and that parent is in the best interest of that child as to that parent. I'm gonna drill down a little bit more as we move forward, but that's kind of an, an initial slide to get us ready. So we know of course that if there is termination, that that severs the legal relationship between the parent and the child. If both parents' rights are terminated as to a child that frees that child up for adoption by another person, which of course could include a relative. As I've already said, the termination ground from the family code, as well as best interest must be proved by clear and convincing evidence. That's our standard in Texas. Okay, here's one caveat. There are ICWA cases. This is the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act. And with native children, the burden is actually higher. It is beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's why it's so important for us to identify our native children early on in the case. At that very first hearing, every time I get a parent in my courtroom for the first time, I ask them if they have any Native American heritage, if they're eligible for membership in a Native American tribe. Now, sometimes blonde-headed, blue-eyed people look at me kind of funny and think, nah, no judge, why would you ask me that? I ask every single person just to be sure, because at the end of the case, at the trial, if that child is eligible for membership, in a tribe. They don't have to be a member. They don't have to know that they're eligible for membership. But if they're eligible for membership in a tribe, that burden goes to beyond a reasonable doubt. And we all know what a heightened requirement that is. And we know that termination cases are 
vastly most likely to be appealed on up to the courts of appeals. And we are seeing an increase in appeals on up to those courts of appeals in termination trials. So just some notes I wanna highlight for termination here before we move on. Termination can be as to one child, if they're more than one children, or as to only one parent for both parents. So it's kind of unusual, but sometimes you might have termination as to one child and not other children. If that child is placed in an adoptive home and others are being uh, reunified or even given conservatorship to a relative. So you don't have to have the same outcome for every child. And really you don't have to have the same outcome for every parent. Although it is the public policy of the state of Texas that if the department is seeking termination as to one parent, they have to seek termination as to both parents. Also, I wanna make sure you, you know, a lot of times kids don't want termination and maybe it's not, not the right thing for them. And they have a valid reason for that. Uh, sometimes we have kids, certainly older kids in our court that are placed in a foster home and they say, judge, I wanna live in this foster home until I turn 18 and beyond, but I do not want my rights to be terminated. That's a tough decision and a tough issue. It results in one of those applas that we talked about earlier, but it might be the best thing. So certainly that's something you need to consider and get the input of all your advocates. Obviously know that this termination is permanent, and just remember that here's a big trauma point for us. So it's something we need to plan for and take care of moving forward. Um, trauma certainly occurs if there's termination, even if it's the best thing for the child beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, let's move forward then. So this slide says finding positive permanency after termination. So even after termination, is it too late to find positive permanency for our children or youth? Obviously, the answer is no, okay, because lots of times that termination is being done to set up an, an adoption by a relative or a foster parent. Regardless of if you have children placed with their grandma who they've been with for two years, or if they're placed in a foster home and they were a baby when they were placed there and now they're nine months old, even if you have great placements, it is still the responsibility of the court to have a judicial expectation of urgency to get those adoptions consummated or to get children placed where they need to be placed or to plan for their aging out if we think they're gonna turn 18 before we get them a permanent placement. Our attorneys certainly need to remain focused here as we move forward. We have some great attorneys across the state of Texas. I'm so proud of the advocacy that they do and the organizations and the certification that we have for them and certainly the guys that appear in my court do an excellent job. If we have a child in PMC, in the permanent care of the department, this is really where our attorneys have to crank it up. We know Koss is with us for the long haul and does a great job, but our attorneys really can do a great job of advocating for their kids at this stage in the case. I've got attorneys that take our kids on college visits all over the state and keep on looking for those relatives. The bullet here says CASA has a collaborative family engagement. It's a new program that they've had for a couple of years. Uh, so State CASA and your local, local program has collaborative family engagement. And that is where we're circling back around, starting from scratch, uh, looking under every rock, leaving no stone unturned to find families or fictive kin for permanent placement. So, as you would expect, permanency hearings after the final order are called permanency hearings after final order. I think Judge Rucker maybe came up with that term. I'll have to ask him about that. So we can still have positive permanency even after we have a final order if the child remains in the permanent custody of the department. We're still looking for relative kin to place for permanent adoption or for conservatorship. We're looking for unrelated adoption. So I just had a couple of weeks ago, a family where kids had been in PMC for a pretty good while. I think um, almost three years, the case had been going on. And last week, I think I had an adoption on Zoom from the state of Minnesota where three of my kids got adopted. And that placement didn't happen until well after that final order had 
been entered. So keep on trucking, trying to find a good place for our kids to be adopted or even conservatorship granted. So the question here is, what if these positive permanency options are not immediately available? We already talked about that. It's not too late. Judges maintain that sense of urgency because the clock is ticking for our kids as they turn 18. What you can do is continue to stay in good contact uh, with the youth and even family if they're still involved and not terminated, trying to find a resolution. Maintain that urgency. And actually the bottom bullet tells us something that is also new in the state of Texas. We now officially have reinstatement of parental rights as an option. And sometimes that is the right option and a good option. You know, there've been a lot of cases where kids have been terminated. Uh, parents have been terminated on young kids. Parents have been in prison. They've been successfully paroled out and doing great. And it is definitely in some cases, absolutely the right idea for those kids and those parents to be reinstated with regards to their parental rights. Okay, so here is the hearing that we have, these permanency review after final order hearings. Here's your code where you can look them up. They happen at least once every six months if parental rights are not terminated. If parental rights are terminated, they happen within every 90 days. Now in our court, and I think in our child protection courts across the state of Texas, it's easier just to schedule every permanency hearing within 90 days. Uh, the law doesn't require it, but I certainly think that that's a best practice as we review those cases. The court's going to review the child's educational needs, and we're going to talk about that a lot more in a bit. Uh, the goals for permanency, participation of in participation in age-appropriate activities. Okay, that's a big deal for us. Our kids want to have normalcy. Sometimes we have kids that are 17 years old. They just want to be normal kid, uh, get to go spend the night with their friends, jump on their trampolines, all that sort of stuff. That is something that you really need to make sure that you're allowing your kids to do if it's appropriate. So, um, you know, maybe ask a child when they come to court, what is it that you really want to do, but that your foster parent says you can't do because you're a foster kid? There's certainly ways for you to work around those things. These hearings continue until the child reaches 18. Now, we still can keep jurisdiction and have hearings after the child reaches 18, but permanency review hearings end when the child turns 18. Okay, I want to say a few things from my notes here. Uh, sometimes it's, it's easy to say, is the child still in their same placement? Okay, let's move along. We really need to be focusing not on their placement and even the stability of their placement, but permanency. What are we going to do to find a permanent placement? Look at those long-term connections to the child. And as I've said earlier, we can have extended care where the child can remain in our jurisdiction past the time they turn 18. And we can be talking about educational outcomes, GEDs, things such as that. All right. That's when we're going to talk about it right now. Extended foster care. So, if a child turns 18 and they're still in the conservatorship of the department, they can voluntarily remain in care until they're 21. And actually, under the COVID orders, we extended that for a little bit, but the law says until they're 21. And here's some qualifications how they can do that. If they're attending high school or a GED program, if they're in college or an institution of higher learning, so we have lots of our foster kids now who are in college, getting degrees, but also this applies to TSTI and technical schools as well. Okay, if they're participating in a program or an activity that promotes or removes barriers to employment, so that's the workforce commission type of issues. And if they're employed for 80 hours a month or more, or if they are incapable of doing any of the above activities because of a documented medical condition. So there's a lot of reasons that kids can stay in extended foster care. It's a great thing. It's wonderful. It's been a real blessing to a lot of our kids and we'll talk about that more as we move forward as well. Okay, we're gonna talk about that here. I wanna make sure I'm on track. So we're gonna talk about supervised independent living. Supervised independent living is what we call SIL or a SIL program. So if someone says something about a SIL program in your court, you know we're talking about 
supervised independent living. It's a type of voluntary extended foster care where young adults can live out on their own, but they still get casework and support services to help them continue to become independent and self-sufficient. This is an amazing, great program, and we have a lot of really dedicated agency staff across the state of Texas that do a great job in helping our kids through these programs. So they can be placed in apartments, they can be placed in non-college type dormitories, uh, they can be placed in host homes, shared housing, but the most exciting thing to me is college dormitories. So recently across the state of Texas, a lot of our colleges systems have been becoming SIL programs on campus. So for example, you can go to Texas A&M University at Corpus Christi, be a full-time student, and be placed in a SIL program there. And they have uh, 365 days worth of housing and meals for kids. Uh, they get medical services. Even if they're not in summer school, they can stay there for the summer. And if you're in Corpus Christi, you can go even lay on the beach. You get free medical service. It is a really great program for our kids who want to go to college. Okay, I can talk about that for another hour, but I think I better move on. If you want to read more about this, the department website here is at the bottom. Hopefully that's a hot link and you don't have to type all of that in. Okay, moving on from SIL programs. So can positive permanency still be achieved at this late date for our kids? Even if they're about to turn 18 or 18, yes, there are always permanent options for kids up until they turn 18. Set your expectations. Continue to talk to them, family, and see if you can't find a place for them. Remember, remind everybody about the urgency. And then, you know, in the back of your mind, remember that we have the possibility of reinstatement of parental rights. Okay, so we're going to talk about some topics here that are very pressing across our state. These are hot topics, new topics, critical topics with the issues that we're facing here in Texas and of course across the states as well. First of all, we're gonna talk about dual status youth. So uh, Jamie worked hard and we have some legislation with regards to dual status youth. And here's the definition from the family code. A dual status child is a child who has been referred to the juvenile justice system. Okay, just a child that is referred to the juvenile justice system. And they're either in the TMC or PMC of DFPS, right? Temporary or permanent conservatorship of the agency. Or maybe they're the subject of a case for which a family-based safety service case has been offered or provided by the agency. So if they've been simply referred to the juvenile justice system and there's an investigation and they've been offered services to the child welfare system, that's a pretty low standard, but they're still meeting the definition of a dual status child or if they're the alleged victim of abuse or neglect in an open investigation, that also qualifies them, or they're a victim in a case where after an investigation, the agency concluded that there was reason to believe that the child was abused or neglected. Okay, it's a pretty low standard to be identified as a dual status child, and that's a good thing. And here's why. So I wanna look, here's a great slide. Uh, here's some data from the Casey Family Programs, and there's the link to it. And when I gave this presentation live, it was almost impossible for me to read this slide. I can do a little bit better job here in my office. But these are kind of sobering statistics. 92% of crossover youth, that's those dual status youth, 92% of dual status youth are first involved in the child welfare system. So we understand that that's kind of a gateway into the juvenile justice system. 40% of dual status youth are female, and that is amazingly disproportionately high compared to the general population. Okay, so dual status youth mainly start off in the child welfare system, a lot more females than typical. If they're a dual status youth, they're 47% at a greater risk for, mal for maltreatment. Okay, that's no surprise there. African-American youth are greatly overrepresented in, as dual status youth. 56% of dual status youth are African-American. 
And it will come as no surprise for you to learn that 83% of dual status youth have mental health or substance abuse challenges. So that is why in our state, we're really focusing on our dual status youth. Here's a simple slide uh, that we can zip through quickly. Uh, it just tells us uh, the system comparison. Of course, both cases are civil cases with confidentiality. Child welfare is permanency focused. Hopefully you have figured that out by this point of our presentation, where the juvenile system is rehabilitation focused. Um, the child, in the child welfare system, you have the right to counsel, uh, which is limited, uh, somewhat limited. And in the juvenile justice system, it is not limited. Of course, we talked about the burdens in the child welfare system already and in, in the juvenile justice system, we know it is beyond a reasonable doubt. And finally, maybe most importantly, Miranda doesn't apply in a child welfare system case, uh, but in the juvenile justice system, of course, Miranda and additional protections apply to the benefit of that juvenile. So if you're the judge or you're an attorney in court, uh, let's be thinking about identifying our du dual status youth. It's a great idea for us to have one family, one judge in my court. It works out because I'm the only judge in town. So if you have a juvenile justice system case and a child welfare case, I'm going to be the judge that you're going to see. And that's a good thing. So you can have concurrent planning in my court. Uh, the children are represented in both systems by the same attorney, which helps a lot as well. And you can hope for agency coordination. Those silos between juvenile justice and child welfare are coming down and we're doing a good job of having agency coordination. So a few things to talk about here in my notes for this slide. There are some models for dual status programs across the state of Texas. We have one in Austin, San Antonio. We have some rural uh, places as well, Houston. Uh, we can't forget Judge Coley out there in Waco and the program that he's running, El Paso. And we also have House Bill 1887, which you can investigate on your own. So most of the jurisdictions that have these programs are large urban or maybe even mid-sized communities. Our child protection court judges are starting to focus on this issue in the rural areas. But if you don't fit into any of those categories, uh, we can still help you engage and have resources for you if you want to do that. Okay. We're going to switch gears and talk about one of my favorite topics now, uh, education issues. And I'm going to check my time first to make sure that I'm on track here. I think we're doing okay on time. So we're going to talk about education issues. The good news is I'm not going to read this slide to you. I probably couldn't even read it if I tried, but you can go back and pause the presentation and read through here. I'll give you a few of the highlights. First of all, we know it's always important for us to use data to inform the efforts that we take. There is a national working group on foster care and education, and they developed this fact sheet. You can go back and look at it, and I'm going to point out a few of the statistics here from the national data. Texas data is very consistent with this. So first of all, school stability is a major challenge for kids in foster care. So when we remove kids from their home placement and place them with a relative or into foster care, very, very often they have to change schools and that is a huge um, impact on them with regards uh, to development, uh, trauma, et cetera. Somewhere between a third and up to three quarters of kids change schools upon removal and that's a national statistics. So there's different studies, but at the very minimum, at least a third of our kids who come into care have to change their schools. One third of kids in foster care go to more than five different schools during their placement. That's tough. We don't need to talk about how challenging that has to be for our kids. In Texas, students in care are six and a half times more likely to attend one or more schools in one year, okay? That's tough too. Somewhere between a third and a half of kids are in special education. Uh, we have underrepresentation and overrepresentation of foster kids in special ed. So if you have a child that you think is subject to uh, needing an evaluation, 
please be on top of that and make sure that your CASA and your attorney for your kids are getting those issues resolved. Somewhere between 40 and 60% of our kids nationwide actually graduate from high school by the time they turn 18. And a pretty sobering number, somewhere between three and 10% of kids in foster care get a bachelor's degree. That's tough. It's a poor outcome. It's terrible. And there's a lot of good people working really hard to improve that. But just remember, it's not a reflection upon the intelligence of the kids in foster care. It's really uh, a reflection of the system. And there are a lot of things you can do as a judge to help with the educational outcomes of your kids from the time they come into care as a child all the way until they turn 21 years old. Okay, so to reiterate, here's some educational challenges for kids in foster care. School stability, we've talked about. They lose their peer connections and even their adult connections to teachers and coaches. Um, it may not be a positive school climate. Certainly school disciplinary interventions are something that we really need to talk about. And we also have to think about the educational issues for our kids who are in RTCs and residential treatment or even in hospital settings, how we can educate those kids. So my notes for this slide say that school mobility is at the heart of why education is such a challenge for kids in care, we know that. We know that these kids are exposed to trauma and that can come from school as well because um, as Jamie's put it, they have an invisible backpack that carries that trauma with them from school to school to school. So losing all those connections can be traumatic. It's important that our schools maintain a positive climate and that their use of punitive discipline is moderated and tailored for our kids who have already been through so much trauma. You can imagine the bullying and stigmatization that a foster care may have, but they're also carrying that trauma backpack with them. And it's important for administrators and teachers to understand how the discipline really needs to be trauma-informed specific to our kids. We've already talked about youth in RTCs and even in hospital settings are gonna feel isolated. Of course, um, they have no normalcy, but we have to do our best to allow them to reach their educational goals and have education. It's the law, it's Texas law, it's federal law as well. The good news is at the bottom of the day, at the end of the day, we know that our kids are incredibly resilient. These kids are amazingly resilient and keep pushing education opportunities for our kids because they will take advantage of those and it will be a life-changing event for them. So keep education at the top of your list there. Okay, so I think this is one more slide about education and foster kids. So top five things, number one, Encourage school stability. So if you're having to make a decision about a placement change, A, consider if the child is going to have to have a school change as well, but also tailor those changes around testing. Sometimes we move kids three days before their star tests, and that not only makes the kids upset, but it really drives administrators crazy as well. So think about testing dates, um, those sorts of things when you're making uh, decisions about placement. We have tons of support for students with disabilities. We could talk for hours and hours about that as well. There are lots of opportunities for us to support our kids with disabilities. And we have links to that on the Children's Commission website and you can find a ton of information there. The next bullet says courts can enforce statutory duties and attorneys can advocate for children and youth educational rights under federal and state law, okay? So courts can stick their nose into the school's business. I think that's what we're trying to say here. Um, if your kid is in special education and you're an attorney, go to that ARD. Judges, make sure your CASAs and your attorneys go to those ARDs. I have personally subpoenaed superintendents and principals and teachers and coaches from school districts into my courtroom so we can resolve issues if we have to. Now, I wouldn't make a habit of doing that. It's something that I don't say to brag about, but I want you to know if you have to advocate for your kids, judge, this is something that you need to do. And this is something, something that I'm passionate about. 
And then the last bullet there says, uh, prepare for transitions. And then that means from pre-K to elementary, to junior high, to high school and beyond. So be thinking about that in all of your permanency hearings as well. Okay. So here are some of those links and resources that I talked about. You can freeze frame this and go find those later on. We're gonna talk for just a few more minutes about community-based care and some other issues. Community-based care is here in Texas and it's expanding across the state of Texas. And this is a system where private agencies, not the child welfare public system, but private agencies are providing care and case management for children in the care of the agency. They provide services for children, youth, and families, hopefully within their community. Uh, we're trying to get more community services localized. What we call an SSCC, which is a single source continuum contractor. A single contractor is responsible in community-based care for finding placements, that's foster homes, other placements, and providing the full spectrum of services for children and their families in the agency's care. So we have performance measures that are set statutorily and through agency policy. And they include things such as safety, recidivism, uh, placement stability, least restrictive settings, which is also in response to federal law. Placements within 50 miles of the child's home are siblings placed together, which is something we could talk a lot more about. And also whether they're completing their PAL classes, their preparation for adult living classes. Here's a nice map. It's a little bit skewed. I'm not sure that's exactly what Texas looks like, uh, but here's a map of those catchment areas. It may be in their jurisdiction where you live. If not, it's certainly coming to a county near you soon. So I want to spend just a few minutes here also talking about residential treatment centers or RTCs. Uh, sometimes our children have to be placed in residential treatment because of their therapeutic needs. Uh, it is meant to be a short-term intervention that across the state sometimes that lags. Uh, we need to remember that it's important even in these settings for us to have family engagement and always be planning for transitioning out of RTCs. Attorneys, hammer that for your kids. What is our transition planning? Now in Texas we have something called heightened monitoring that's going on and qualified residential treatment programs. Wow, you didn't know we were gonna get this far out into the weeds in this presentation. But for just a second, I'm gonna talk about heightened monitoring and QRTPs. So heightened monitoring is a result of a federal lawsuit in which the department was a party. And it is a stringent framework set in place by federal court for reviewing placements in compliance with child care licensing standards. So if you don't do many CPS cases, you have to understand that this is a big issue going on in our state, that there is heightened monitoring for placements, and it may have changed the face of child welfare and placements since the last time you had a CPS case. And finally, QRTPs. So there's a federal Families First Prevention Services Act. Maybe this is the last acronym I'll talk about today. The FFPSA, the Family First Prevention Services Act from the federal government. And it defines a qualified residential treatment program, a QRTP. We're in the process of figuring out what that's going to look like in the state of Texas. We don't have any QRTPs in our state right now, but we do have some pilot programs that we're looking at getting started. A QRTP is a highly structured approach to treating children with the very most acute needs in the system. And they have very strict criteria, including federal accreditation, 24-hour clinical on-site staff, assessments, family engagement. And there's also going to be a required court review process for QRTP placements. So, all of our judges are gonna to have to learn this new process and how we're going to review QRTPs. The last thing I wanna say about QRTPs is um, we need to be extremely careful about ordering kids into QRTPs as a blanket order. If uh, maybe that's the right thing to do and attorneys 
you very well may need to advocate for this placement. It may be a great idea for your child. But before an attorney advocates for a QRTP placement, before a judge orders that placement, let's make sure that we understand exactly what that means because it's pretty restrictive. Okay. There are some more recesses, resources for you. It's about time for us to have a recess, but here's some resources for you. You can freeze frame and look those up. Let me just say also that this presentation is a primer. It was designed to be a high level overview. And I would just wanna encourage each of you, if you're a judge or if you're an attorney to take a look at our Texas Children's Commission's bench book. I've got a copy right here with me. It's great. And it tells you way more in depth uh, all the topics that we talked about here today. And it also contains bench cards and they're kind of like an at a glance, we all know what bench cards are. So if you need to look at a bench card on a specific topic, we have some very well thought out bench cards. Uh, folks from across the state of Texas, attorneys, causes, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, lots of advocates have done a wonderful job in collaborating on this bench book. It's wonderful. The bench cards are good as well. We talk about things like that Indian Child Welfare Act. There's issues such as human trafficking, which is a huge issue we didn't even touch on here today in the state of Texas. Disproportionality, which of course means over or under representation of minorities. And also, maybe most importantly, how to engage our youth in the decisions that we're making about them in their future. So that's the resource slide. And MCLE, what we've all been waiting for, for those of you who've been watching the presentation, um, you can email the email link there and we will give you information about MCLE. Okay, I think I'm done. And I think Jamie's gonna come back and wrap things up for us. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Judge Hoffman for an excellent presentation. I'd just like to take a minute to emphasize that the Children's Commission has many tools and resources that may be able to assist you on the bench or in the courtroom, and these are all available at absolutely no cost to judges and attorneys and others around the state. Please take a look at our website, texaschildrenscommission.gov, and especially the bench book that Judge mentioned, uh, so we can support you in this very challenging but really rewarding area of law. Thank you so much for joining us today. Again, if you have any questions about MCLE, please contact cctraining at txcourts.gov. Thank you again to all of our viewers and of course to Judge Hoffman. Take care, stay well, and have a great day.